it the last speaker of, if I find the name, yeah, here it is. <laughs> the last speaker of this, this session is Dr. Rotri, and he will talk about method to initiate an LENR reaction in an aqueous solution. My, more or less right. Thank you very much. My name is Brian Rorty, and the topic is a method initiated in Lena reaction aqueous solution. And by the way, I am not a doctor, so I want to correct that. Don't want to presume too much here. Um, let's get going. <coughs> um, a brief history of the protocol that's been developed here. Uh, I presented a protocol at ICCF uh, 16 in Chennai, that was seven years ago. A friend and I began with the Fleischmann Pons protocol on an open beaker. We wanted to test the effect of a surfactant and chose one called anionic silica hydride. We didn't realize at the time, but that added a soluble silicyclooxane cage that could host lithium ions. In the protocol, we applied concurrent electrical and photonic stimuli. Later, we started testing in a sealed steel reactor because we wanted better instrumentation for quantifiable results and less loss of material. I got tired of buying heavy water that was boiling away. Yeah, <clears throat> I thought that might get a chuckle. All of our experiments were performed at or near the boiling point, and an observation we made over time was that each time we increased the silica in the system, the reaction improved. So that sets a pattern, add more silica. Uh, specifically, I want to say that this does not rely upon the loading of a palladium lattice. We have used multiple metals for uh, electrodes, including gold, and gold does not form a hydride. I think McCurby said on Monday morning, the recognize the distinct possibility that uh, palladium might not be essential for the Lenner reaction. That would be, appear to be the case in our situation. This is the picture of the reactor. Um, there are, that's not working. Try that, okay. I have some relief valves for safety purposes. Uh, there's a gas inlet valve, an atmospheric exhaust valve, I've got that involved for a particular reason, and if you notice, there's a blue, uh, green handle. Electrodes with Teflon grommets, there can be two or three, depending on the configuration. Thermocouple wells, glass thermocouple wells, again, two or three, depending on the, depending on the conf configuration. The photonic stimuli provided by LEDs that are um, going through ports laterally into the interior, and there's a heating element to bring the reactor up to the boiling point and maintain it there. One of the things that advanced our work a lot was we found a superior host for the lithium ion guest. Uh, it's called Octa TMA POS. It's made by a company called Hybrid Plastics in Mississippi. They describe it as being a hybrid molecule with an inorganic silsiscoxane at the core, an anionic hydrogen, and a tetramethyl ammonium ion at the corners of the cage. I put that in quotes because that's their description. So in this case, R is the tetramethyl, tetramethyl ammonium. It's highly soluble, and what we think, oh, they've got good quality. It's a legitimate company. They've got quality controls. But uh, what we think is happening here is the lithium ion is entering that silsiscoxane cage, and that sets up a condition that facilitates the reaction. More on that later. This was the first experiment we did with this TMA POS. Um, there are four traces here. The well, there are three blue, but the two dark blue, excuse me, there are two, the two upper blue are the uh, temperature of the liquid in the reactor. The bottom one is the temperature of the headspace, and here's the pressure transducer. And interestingly, as I was bringing this thing up to the area of operation, which would be at or near the boiling point, we got the reaction, which is, and, and the signature, the, the thermal signature, this char uh, characteristic of this reaction. So, see the steep vertical jump of about a uh, degree and a half, and concurrently we've got the pressure transducer. So I believe what's happening here is that's evidence of a phase change. Some of the water is being converted to steam. Um, what's kind of interesting here is that this reaction may be more temperature dependent than time dependent because it occurs pretty much as soon as we get in the area of interest. Um, I can't say that happens all the time because it doesn't. Uh, it has happened more than once, but it does not always happen. Uh, the significance of the temperature and the pressure transducer uh, responding concurrently, they're different measurement technologies. And finally, we'll also see what appear to be two different modes of 
of the reaction. This steep pulse, and then this <coughs> sawtooth kind of ramp. Different signatures, something else is going on. Okay, <clears throat> found a way to initiate those reactions at will. Frankly, I had a problem with uh, losing solution in the, rack, in the reactor, and that meant leaks. So I took steps to improve the ceiling, and I thought that would make everything better, and it went the opposite direction. Uh, reactions started to take longer to occur, and they tended to be smaller, so that was counterintuitive. I began to suspect the small leaks were initiating the reaction, and I had a very simple, unsophisticated approach. I deliberately drove the temperature above the boiling point, specifically got it up to 112, I took my right hand, reached over that green valve handle, and cracked it. Moved it very slowly. What I saw was a single bubble of condensate formed at the top of the valve, and it popped. Closed the valve again, and then checked the, uh, the data log. And here's what you see. The yellow, or gold, is the pressure, and that's where I cracked the valve so it drops. Um, this is the temperature of the liquid and it drops momentarily and then it rises again. It declines, settles out, and then I tested it a second time. This is the, uh, the head space. It doesn't even decline, it goes straight up. It rises about a degree centigrade. And then they decline in parallel. Um, okay, it, I said that's 112 degrees, so the baseline is about, a, in this case, about 108. Uh, when it stabilized, I did it again. Cracked the valve a second time. I got a similar reaction, but muted, because there's less pressure relief. So, something's happening. Um, this idea of gases expanding, pressure dropping, and temperatures rising is unexpected, because it violates scalar sacks law. It simply shouldn't happen. It doesn't happen in your refrigerator, doesn't happen in your air conditioner, it shouldn't happen, but it does and it is very reliable. I've got a lot of repeatability here. And I did some testing about just releasing pressure uh, away from the boiling point, and it, it doesn't work. It's the phase change that drives this reaction. I think this is of interest because potentially you can divide, design devices to exploit the anomaly. And a thought, where is McCubrey? Hello, Mike. You and I had a conversation a few years ago, and you articulated what you called McCubrey's principle of disequilibrium. I didn't get a chance to check this with you, but you recognize that as your principle. Yes? Sure. Sure, okay. <laughs> Thank you. So Leonard reactions tend to occur faster and to be more robust at disequilibrium, that is, the stimuli and other variables are changing with time rather than remaining static. A phase change is certainly a disequilibrium. That may be something that's happening here certainly contributing to it. So I built a test device using the phenomena, and it was very simple. It's a coarse tube drawn to, drawn to a venturi with a capillary throat that had an ID of 0.18 millimeters. For those of you who think in English, that's seven, seven thousandths of an inch. I included two means of dropping the pressure. First, as the fluid flows through the capillary, there's gonna be a um, drop in pressure as the capillary resistance. As it passes through the throat, there'll be a drop in pressure. I'm getting confusing myself. Secondly, I had some very good conversations with um, Roger Stringham and uh, added an ultrasonic stimulator, uh, a pizza electric disc, with an acoustic coupler. That generates cavitation bubbles in the fluid. They expand and contract, and when they contract, there's a reduction in pressure. Um, I used one that I've frequency of 1.6 megahertz, and I did that simply because he told me to do it, and it worked, so I was pleased. I placed thermocouples on the exterior, actually three of them, wrapped it with Teflon tape for insulation, wrapped it with nichrome wire because I needed to heat it to maintain it at the boiling point, or slightly above, and then added more insulation just to equalize the temperature. I had found something in some experimentation I thought was really helpful. It is not necessary to stimulate the liquid in the throat. When I first started pursuing this idea, I thought I was going to have to do that, apply electrical and photonic stimulation in the throat. That vastly complicates fabrication. If you don't have to do that, just draw the venturi. You get the, the throat itself. Um, 
if you don't have to treat it in the throat, what you can do instead is uh, treat it with a protocol while it's in the reactor, and that's I call that prime in it. Then I use the reactor as a reservoir of prime, flu of prime fluid. I convey it through the through a feed line into the into the uh, test device. <coughs> One test device, um, and here by the way you see the Manchuri. It's simply a quartz tube. Right around there, you can see the throat. I apologize for the quality of the pictures, but trying to take a picture of glass, you don't get much, so please bear with me here. This is the acoustic coupler, and that's the piezoelectric disc. The cracking occurred right there, slightly upstream of the piezoelectric. Um, there was no previous stress in the quartz and no load. You can check for, check for stress with a uh, uh, polarized light, the glass blower did that, there was none. Um, and also, by the, it, it did not break until I applied the ultrasonic. It was sound. Then I uh, flowed, flew it through it, applied the ultrasonic, and all of a sudden it was gone. It was literally dangling. First, that was very frustrating. And the parenthetical remark, I really do prefer non-destructive testing. <laughs> Much better idea. Um, second test is obviously got better data. This is another test device. It's so another quartz venturi with a capillary throat and logs several heat bursts in this case. Thermocups are placed on the outside of the throat. There's a first group of uh, pulses over here, uh, temperature pulses. That was only with a capillary. I did not apply the, the ultrasonic stimulation until I got here. So that's only with the pressure drop of the capillary. This is the compound effect of the uh, capillary and the ultrasound. I'm gonna make a comment here. I'm having some of the same problems uh, Jelani is having, and that is I'm not sure I can trust my uh, thermocouple readings. The problem is they're too persistent. I think they're correctly capturing the initiation of the event, but I open that valve for, well, not too long, probably less than a minute and the readings are staying high for almost two minutes. I would expect that to come up and go back down. I was doing that because I wanted to show that something was happening with the valve. I wanted to be able to turn it on, turn it off, under control. This, I would expect to be a, a larger uh, gap. Then I uh, open it a second time, and I think that's that rise there, and it reached a maximum temperature of 502 degrees C. Turned it off a third pulse, and by that time I was probably out of fluid. These other traces, by the way, that's the temperature of the liquid. This is the temperature in the headspace. And as you would expect, as we're drawing down the, uh, the, the fluid level, and it's being replenished by outside air, that temperature is dropping. Um, <clears throat> something just jumps out here. Um, that thermocouple on the outside of the uh, the Venturi starts out at 122 degrees C. The maximum temperature is 502 degrees C. That's a lot of temperature. Don't know that's an awful lot of heat, but it sure is encouraging, at least encourages me. Okay, uh, I will, I've had reproducibil reproducibility problems with the quartz. I'm not having them in, in the static case. When I crack a valve, that works very reliably. I, I would characterize it as being routine. But it's just been hard work in the dynamic case. So I wanted a smaller idea at the throat. I wanted to drive with higher pressures, and bluntly quartz was too brittle and too difficult to work with. So I've decided to experiment with ceramics. Two ceramics, I'm not, well, I've, I've experimented, I'm just not going to use them because they've proven to be inhibiting substances, and that's alumina and zirconia. Um, I've noted that several people are reporting results with zirconia. If it works with your protocol, great, but it apparently does not work with mine, so I can't explain the difference. I began a search for material that enhances the reaction, and I wanted these attributes, a high operating temperature, high strength, high temperature conductivity, and I wanted to be rich in silica. Continuing this pattern, the silica seems to, excuse me, silicon, I shouldn't be saying silica. That's an error. I should say silicon. My apologies for the error. Uh, I went over to talk to Fran Tanzella and a guy who's a Fran's machinist named Bill Olson. 
And Bill asked if I had considered silicon carbide. Very easy answer. No, I haven't even heard of silicon carbide. Just happened to run into it before. So he recommended it or suggested I try it and he provided samples. Uh, gave me three pieces. And I conducted the test with one of those pieces in the reactor. I literally just set up my protocol, dropped in a small piece of silicon carbide just to see what would happen. Here's what happened. Five minutes, thank you. Um, I did not initiate this reaction. This was a case where it just rose spontaneously. It rose 5.4 degrees C in 0.44 seconds. You can read that. The headspace rose 7.2 degrees C in the same time. If you accept the measurements, the power released to the liquid is 31 watts. That's if the thermocouple readings are accurate. That's a lot of power. The power of the headspace is probably would probably be greater than that because that's where the phase change phase change would be taking place, and of course takes more calories to turn water into steam. Um, if you want to find out how much uh, heat that would take to drive that much phase change, you can torture the, you know, the ideal gas law and come up with a number, but it's really not relevant. The ideal gas law does not apply at the phase change. You got saturated, you know, the, the head space is saturated with steam. It just doesn't work. So I, I wouldn't report that. There are uncertainties with this experiment. Uh, the sample was stored in a toolbox. Bill Olson just blew into the toolbox, opened the drawer, pulled out the pieces. The composition is uncertain. Uh, I'm going to do some testing, see what I can find, some elemental testing with EDX. And I know people add additives, and they're generally proprietary. So if you call the manufacturer and say, what are you, what are you doing with it, they won't tell you. I have tested a pure form of silicon carbide. What I was hoping is I could bring some positive results to this group and encourage people to use this substance because it, it could be useful. Um, it did not repeat the results, so I can't bring the joy joy. So what this is telling me is that the additives in these silicon carbides are critical, and that means the variable space is vast. I got some testing to do. OK, what's happening here? Um, as I said, the lithium ion is a guest in the sil 6 oxane cages. I believe it's sharing its open two s orbitals with multiple silicon valence electrons, and that uh, they're forming a lithium silicon 8 O12 molecule with the same uh, Monium, uh, trimethylmonium radicals. So you got eight silicon atoms, they've got 16 3p electrons. They've each got two obes and they're passing through the silicon. So there's an opportunity here for some exchange to take place between lithium valence electrons and the silicon nucleus. I suspect it's a handoff that's happening, some nuclear energy attribute. I can't tell you what's happening, how, what's being handed off or how it's happening. I can report the same thing happens with a sil 6 roxane ring. And I now suspect that concurrent electrical and photonic stimuli are exciting the silicon lithium molecule in some way that enables the handoff. I can visualize it this way. So the area of interest, oops, back boy. Apparently I'm having the problem everybody else had. Okay, so the summary. I believe we have a method to initiate an a Lenner reaction. It's an impulse drop in impulse pressure drop driving a phase change in a solution with a lithium ion guest in a sil 6 I think sil 6 that word is not easy. <laughs> sil 6 quioxane cage has been treated with our protocol, and my apologies to Gay Lussac. There are three methods to cause the phase change. You can vent the system, you can drive the liquid through capillary, and you can use ultrasonic stimulation. Stimulation. And I think I've identified a uh, material that may facilitate rather than inhibit a linear reaction. Now, silicon carbide, and I acknowledge the unknown role of, added, of the additives. How am I doing? Am I done? Yeah, you're perfect for questions there. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, just perfect. Do you have time for a few questions? Here, one. Just a quick comment. Uh, I tried silicon carbide abrasive granules uh, in a null. Uh, cell experiment, and I found that it completely destroyed a thermocouple, a type K thermocouple, at about 500 C. It was probably a chemical reaction. I don't know what it was, but if you use silicon carbide for the reactor tube, you need to be aware of that. Uh, 
I think where I'm going with this is I would like to uh, fabricate a Venturi out of silicon carbide, test it, and see what I get. And uh, you know, clearly where I'm going here, and that's why I went back to this slide, uh, this Venturi is kind of an embryonic form of a nozzle. And what I would like to do is find a way to build a nozzle that will achieve these 502, to, damn it. Oh, brother, never mind. <coughs> Okay. Simple statement. If I can get water out at 502, or steam out rather, 502 degrees centigrade, it will solve a whole lot of problems. I think that would be obvious. So thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you. So this is uh, the end of the session. I think we have something to do. Where is uh, Dave Nagel? He's not doing instructions. He's coming. Thank you.